Welcome everyone uh, to the first session of the Agile Mindset uh, team. Today, the first session is by Kathy Burkage. She is taking a session on mindful agile leadership. We are glad that you could join us today. So, without much delay, let's just get started. Um, over to you, Kathy. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Fincy. I'm just, I hope you can all see my screen. I don't have a lot of slides and there's not much on my slides, but I just wanted to make sure you've got something to look at. You can see my name, Kathy Burkage. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. I'm joining you, of course, from hmm, uh, an interesting day here in Melbourne. It's lovely to be here. I'm just, uh, it's a shame that I can't be there in person like all of us, but uh, we are making the best of it. So uh, I'm an Agile coach. I'm an Agile trainer. I spent more than 15 years working with Agile teams. So leadership, when we think about leadership, it's good to have a bit of an understanding of a definition. So good old dictionary.com says leadership is a process of social influence where a person, i.e. the leader, secures the support and help of others to accomplish a shared task. So the leader isn't telling anybody what to do. They get support for people to join in and to do something together. So when we think about leadership, we know one of the greatest leaders of all times is this guy. Many of you are familiar with him, I'm sure, Gandhiji. So Gandhi was an inspirational leader. And this is uh, the quote that you can see there. It's not a full quote. It's not the whole thing he said. He said, um, uh, to affect change, you've got to be the change you want to see in the world. This is, for me, one of the most inspirational lines, not just of leadership, but by anything, because we are the change, we are the culture, we are the way people, uh, the, way, the way the work, the world works. Apologies there. So when we think about Gandhi and why he was so inspirational, he was really, he inspired through a vision and he shared the vision and it wasn't his vision, it was a vision not just for him but for all Indians. It was for giving spirit and pride and equality to all Indians and through this vision, he united all people to support and work towards achieving this vision. He led through example. He didn't tell people what to do. He demonstrated how people should behave, how people should act, how what the, 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 the way we should work, the way we should um, put our actions into words, our words into actions. And he regarded himself a slave of the people. He wanted to serve people to help accomplish the vision together. He practised what he preached. He didn't just say words. He did. He, when he said we should think about homegrown and home values, that's how he practised by the homespun that he created. He was seen one of the people. He regarded himself as just an ordinary Indian along with everybody else. No one special, no one above anybody else, equal. He provided and gave hope to the people. He didn't say it was my job and you have to do it for me. No, 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 it was for them. And people were given hope through this vision. He demonstrated great leadership qualities such as persistence, he was beaten down over and over again, locked up, but he always got up. He stuck to his values and he forgave those people. He didn't hold a grudge. He know, knew people, so many people were against him and he didn't, he didn't hold any, any disregard to them whatsoever. He was forgiving. He showed great strength of character through his morals of simplicity and discipline. He didn't hold anybody to a higher value than to himself. And he kept true to this, his morals and his values. He saw truth as a powerful weapon. He was present and he didn't believe in wasting time in going back over the past or forecasting too far in the future. He was focused on the tasks at hand and getting stuff done now. And, of course, we know that he was all about nonviolence peace and calm, no matter how difficult the circumstances were. Many leaders today could take a leaf out of that book. 
when we think of non-violence, it's about making sure we create that environment where no one is combative, no one is getting angry. We are all staying in this calm, peaceful way. He inspired faith in himself. He had belief in what he could do. He had a can-do attitude. He didn't get knocked back and, and felt, oh, I have to quit now. He kept persisting. He felt it was his responsibility to the people. He ingrained himself in the moment and the cause. He focused on the vision of India for the future and getting there with commitment. And through this way of being inspirational, his vision, it brought in the credibility and trust because it motivated the people and he didn't make it, this is my cause, come and do it. He made it their cause, your cause, and that's how he gained support of the people. So when we think about leadership, we know that studies show over and over again it's the behaviour of the leader that has the greatest impact on the people that they lead, on the teams. It's not the technical competencies, which is such a large factor at all. It's how the leader behaves and goes about the way that they do things. And we know that the way the leader is can be quite contagious for the team. If the leader's in a great mood, the team can be a great mood. If the leader's in a terrible mood and negative, that can affect the team. It's like a contagion. It affects us all. So what kind of leader are we? Are we calm, confident, open and relaxed? That's what we can inspire in our teams. Or are we stressed and fearful and closed off and angry and frustrated and pointing fingers? That's not the kind of leader we want because that's what's going to rub off to the team. So the values of the leader is really important to walk the walk and talk the talk and inspire others to be the way, you know, by leading by example, have that integrity uh, and inspiring others to creating a shared vision. So it's not about doing it for me, it's doing it for us together. So we need to create that openness, that learning and discovery, challenging self and others, building trust through action, not just words. And most importantly, when we think of leadership, it's recognising others' work, recognising the impact others have. This results in teams being more committed, being proud of their work, being motivated and loyal, and, of course, what we want today in today's Agile teams is productivity and engagement. Without these, well, we're not going to get so much done. So I'm here to talk a little bit about mindful Agile leadership. So we've talked a little bit about leader. and We've looked at a great example of leadership. So Agile leadership is not just good leadership with the word Agile tacked on. It's more than that. It's a balance of three essential ingredients. All of them are equal, all of them are essential. If we miss any of them, the stool, like a three-legged stool, would fall over because it can't balance. So these three elements provide a stable base and we look at the beneficial qualities of all of them to make us a more effective and authentic Agile leader. So we're going to look at them each one, the Agile mindset, servant leadership, and, of course, mindfulness. And I want to say that mindfulness is not an optional extra. It's what really gives power to the other two. So the agile mindset, most of us have heard this over and over again. It's not a new thing. We've heard the catch cry, being agile versus doing agile. That's what the agile mindset is. And when we say mindset, it's not some mystical thing. It's an attitude that we take. It is an approach and how we think. That's what mindset is. And how we think and how we approach and what our attitude is shapes the way we act. So when we think about the agile mindset, it's that collaborative way of working. It's a true sense of team, fostering a team spirit. And it's about welcoming change because change is constant, change is everywhere. So we need to be flexible and adaptable and know that change is going to happen and we should be expecting it and be prepared to it and be prepared to go with it, to let go of our old plans and old thoughts and be responsive to what happens now. And when we think about the agile mindset and it's very core, cool, we're thinking about maximising value 
minimising waste, creating high trust and transparency in a team-based approach to work that's fluid and flexible, open to learning, open to feedback, learning from mistakes, being okay if we're not quite right. And of course, most importantly, it's that whole continuous learning and growth and that's a team-based and collaborative way to work with uncertainty. So the agile mindset for a leader is key because if we haven't got that mindset, but we're ex expecting our teams to be agile, not just do agile, it's all very well that we know how to run stand-ups and run sprints. That's not what agile is. It's this attitude. If we can't demonstrate it ourselves, how can we expect the team to have this agile mindset? Servant leadership. Uh, a lot of people get a bit miffed because the word servant is in there, servant leadership, someone's a servant to us. But that's not real. I mean, okay, servant leadership is the concept or that feeling or that desire to serve the team as a priority and leadership is kind of taking a back seat. But when we talk about leadership and what we've just seen with Gandhiji is he really put the people first and equaled himself with the others and that's what leadership's about. It's about focusing on the development of others. In fact, one of the agile principles is all about agile leadership and servant leadership because it talks about creating the environment and the support the team needs and then trusting the team to get the job done. So a servant leader is all about all those things we talk about, removing obstacles, <laughs> enabling the team, generating the right support, creating, uh, doing the work that the team needs so they can get on with the job of just getting the job done, whether it's creating software, developing training, writing a book, or in fact, building a building. It's really about they create the conditions conducive for the team to work. But to do that, we need that vision. So the agile servant leader needs to inspire that vision and make sure everybody can rally around that vision and adopt it as their own. We need to uh, work from a position of humility, humility and humbleness, of being um, empathy for all, compassionate to our team, knowing that we're all people, we're all human. We're not just robots doing work. We need to exhibit patience and that openness, that willingness to see things, not just from our own point of view. So servant leadership and leadership of all kinds is key to have self-awareness. What am I really demonstrating? How am I really being seen? How I think I'm seeing myself and how others see themselves can't be different. So we need to be self-aware and not living in this fantasy world of how we're coming across. We need to increase our listening and ask more questions to develop people above ourselves. And of course, that means doing all the great stuff that our teams need from us, our organisations need return on investment, creating organisational strategy and objections. But we need to increase engagement. Remember, interactions and individuals. So we need to focus on those individuals and help them interact to get that increased engagement. That's what we need in agile teams. We also need to enable creativity in teams. So not just focusing on time, cost and resources, we need to say, hey, how can we solve problems the most effective way possible? So it's not about you, it's about the team. Team before self, enabling them to be awesome. So we lift the team up and give them what they need. It's not about being the best liked or rewarded or recognised. We need to direct the team as needed, but it's more about facilitating the team to be at their best. So when we think about the agile mindset, we can have an agile mindset but not be a servant leader. We can still be commanding and controlling and telling people what to do and expecting them to do what we say. That's no good. Or we can be a servant leader. We can enable people, but then they're not agile. We don't have that flexibility and adaptability and that focus on value that agile mindset gives. They're both needed, so we need to connect those two. But then the last aspect, the last one, which underpins the first two in my mind, is mindfulness. So mindfulness is, uh, has many aspects and not one single definition. 
There's many definitions. I just want to quickly go through a couple. Um, they're from different sources, uh, mindfulness books and the internet, of course. So one is a, a scientific definition of mindfulness is a thinking or moreover a non-thinking process not hung up on ideas, concepts, memories. It's all about just observing whatever is happening as if it was the first time we've ever experienced it. So it's this concept of beginner's mind. The first time we've ever seen something, we look at everything as if it was that first time. Very difficult to do because we've been around the block a few times. So we've seen things a few times. So we go, oh, you know, that's just the agile thing now. And we just don't pay attention so much anymore. It kind of filters into the background. So mindfulness doesn't let us do that. One of the best definitions I've got from a mindful leadership book by um, one of my favourite authors, Bunting, is we maintain an open-hearted awareness, open-hearted awareness of our thoughts, our emotions, our bodily sensation and the environment around us in the present moment. So at its core, mindfulness is awareness. And unfortunately, so often we're not really aware of what's going on around us. In fact, science shows us nearly half the time we're not completely aware. We're driving, we're on, uh, sorry, we're on autopilot mode. Often a lot of what's happening around us is filtered through to the background. So we're barely aware. You might be familiar with driving or being on a train or a bus and you're not really aware of the journey. You're not seeing what's going on, the trees, the, the road, people, other cars. You get home, you think, I don't remember how I got here because we've been on autopilot. Um, so while we're on autopilot and our mind is wandering full of thoughts, replaying the past, thinking about the future, listening to that inner voice chattering, unfortunately, while it doesn't sound like a big problem and it's not, our habitual ways of thinking, unfortunately, most of the time when we're in this mind-wandering autopilot state, we're often dealing with negativity, looking at things negatively, worrying, replaying scenarios, wondering what if could have been. And it quite often is quite an energy-sapping process, even though we don't know. We're so caught up in the past or the future. We're not here right now. We're not aware of what's happening in front of us right here, right now. We're kind of distracted. We're not attentive to what's going out. We're zoned out. So how can we be aware of our teams? How can we be aware of ourselves? How can we be aware of others, the vision? the agile mindset if we're in this default mind wandering mode unfortunately our minds are built to be in this way because otherwise we'd be overwhelmed by information but where our biology has also been made to where to be constantly on the on the lookout for threats that's how we evolved so our mind and our biology is constantly looking for negativity constantly looking for threat so we're in this constant kind of semi-stress state we can't really be there so the only antidote is presence. Mindfulness, I think, is like a carefulness, carefulness of our mind, carefulness of our thoughts, being truly present in real time, here, now, as it really is. Not how we want it to be, not how we hope it to be, not what we expect it to be or how we don't want it to be. It's openness to being here now, without judging good, bad, like, dislike, want, don't want, letting go of that judgment and just saying it is, observing as it is. Because so often those judgments can, can uh, askew the way we think of things. So it's an awareness, paying attention purposely, warm-heartedly, non-judgmentally, experience and accepting what's here now exactly as it is, witnessing calmly, clearly, open-mindedly, engaged in the here and now. And this gives us the freedom to manage ourselves. It's a gift of choice and breaking that habit allows us to take account to our responsiveness to circumstances. When we're under pressure and we're stressed and we've got so much on our plate, it's easy to fall back into that habit and we just act on default. We're not really aware of what's going on. We can give, we can choose our attitude in any given moment. We can choose to pause, 
check in and respond from a more present and open and clear point of view rather than this default mode where we're sort of reacting on autopilot. And it also affects stress. Stress actually comes from within. Otherwise, stress would be the same for all of us. A great example, think about being stuck in traffic. <laughs> Many of you have probably been to Bangalore or, in, or Delhi, you know what I mean by traffic. Now, some people seem to sit in traffic and zone out and be zen, right? Whereas other people are stomping the, the, the steering wheel and swearing and cursing. Now, people can choose. Are they stressed out in traffic or are they just going, well, it is what it is. I'm here. I've got to deal with it. Now, if stress was universal, everyone would be stressed. It's our own attitude to being stuck in traffic that's causing stress or not. It's our own thoughts that are perpetuating stress or not. So stress comes from within. If it was from external, then the same things would stress all of us in the same way, and we know that that's simply not true. So mindfulness is a release from that constant barrage of thoughts that are constantly going around and around our head, that inner voice, dip, 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 dip. So we can, we can let go, let go of these thoughts and adopt a better attitude and a more constructive action. We can learn to absorb, uh, observe, absorb, <laughs> observe our thoughts, uh, observe our feelings and emotions a little bit more distract, um, from a distance so it can prevent us getting wound up and caught up in them and being drawn into those spirals of inappropriate thoughts, unhelpful actions, unhelpful uh, things that we might say. Mindfulness enables us to have this optimum mind state of ease, free of stress, free of anxiety, free of anger, and be more happy, more secure in ourselves and more comfortable with the world as it is. We can drop those stories we tell in ourselves and choose wider and more wiser responses. So when we think of mindfulness in conjunction with servant leadership, now servant leaders need to be more focused on other Mindfulness enables us to say, am I focused on the other? Am I focused on me? I'm caught up in my own thoughts. So mindfulness enables our servant leadership aspect of focusing on others and also the agile mindset. The agile mindset is one of flexibility, of value, of minimising waste and team-based work. Mindfulness enables us to say, are we thinking about me, me, me? Am I thinking about, oh, that didn't go as planned? Are we sticking rigidly to how we thought our plans were? Or are we open to change? Are we being flexible and adaptable, which is the agile mindset? So mindfulness is not an optional extra. Mindfulness and this clarity of thought and dropping that default mode enables us to see, are we being servant leaders? Have we got the agile mindset or not? Without deliberate attention, we won't know. We simply just go on default mode. So mindfulness. <sighs> There's more than one way to do it. Most people seem to think of the two broad categories, informal and formal. Oops, my screen has gone the wrong focus there. So informal mindfulness is the ability to check in with what's going on with our thoughts, going on in our mind, reconnecting with the present at any time, snapping out of this autopilot, lost in thought world, and catching ourselves and coming back to now, becoming open, becoming clear, becoming observant and present today, now neutral and objective. We can do that anytime, anywhere, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days away a year. It costs us nothing. It's just the ability to remember to do it. So at any time, we can just come back, breathe, just for one second, clearing our mind through all that noise that's been cluttering our mind, come, quieten it down, come back, recall and observe, open up and refocus, see things as they are. We can do that anytime. And it literally takes one second. Of course, you can keep going for as long as you want. <laughs> uh, the second type of mindfulness and how we do mindfulness is through meditation. It's the formal way, the tuxedo method, I call it. So when we think about mindfulness and being open and present and non-judgmental and aware, it's 
like a muscle. We need to exercise it. And like going to the gym, when we go to the gym, we can pump weights and get our muscles stronger. So meditation is like that, that muscle exercise for our mind, for our brain. It enables us to um, practice formally that enables us to be more mindful in our day-to-day, everyday life, not just in this formal sitting on a cushion in the lotus position. (laughs) So it's like going to the gym. And for me, meditation, when we go to the gym, we don't go to the gym to be good in the gym. We go to the gym to be great outside the gym, to run faster or be stronger or look better. (laughs) Meditation is not about being a good meditator. Meditation is about being good, mindful, throughout our day outside of meditation so it's all about using that skill and those muscles outside of the formal session so let's do it very quickly together (laughs) so I'm going to invite you now to just sit comfortably rest your hands on your lap close your eyes if you're comfortable to do so just simply clear your mind let go of what we've been talking about, let go of what's around you. Clear your mind of your thoughts just for a moment and just take nice deep breaths in and out naturally, deeply, focusing completely on the sensation of those breaths, breathing in fully and deeply. Exhaling slowly, naturally, bringing our full attention to just those breaths. Letting go of thoughts, directing our attention to our breath. Focus solely just on the act of breathing. Breathing in and breathing out. Nothing to change. Observing each thought, each breath completely. Each breath is unique. Just observe it. Focus on that thought, that breath. And if thoughts come, which they will, just recognise you've had a thought, you've been distracted. So come back to the focus on the breath. Breathing in and breathing out. Nothing more to do, just natural rhythm of the breath. distracted by a thought or a noise, it's okay, it's normal. Calmly, gently, don't follow the thought. Let it go. Bring your attention back to your breath. Relax into that breath. Hold attention to the breath. Taking a nice deep breath in and releasing slowly, breathing out, bringing your attention back to the present and to our presentation. Meditation doesn't need to take a lot of time. Meditation can literally be one or two minutes, which is all we had then. Coming back clearer, more relaxed, more open. That's what it's all about. It's about not being a great meditator, but noticing where our attention is. And if our attention wanders and bringing it back over and over again, that's what meditation is. That's like doing those reps of weights in the gym over and over again when our thoughts wander, bringing it back. And they're going to wander 
and our mind is going to be full of thoughts and that's okay. Sometimes people get a little bit myth saying, oh my God, my mind's crazy. It's like it's the first time you've really sat and noticed how much our thoughts are constantly going around and around. So it's that ability to bring our thoughts back. So let's look at mindful, agile leadership and some key aspects. There's a lot more to it than what we can go through in such a short session. I'm just going to quickly go through six kind of key areas, but there's a lot to it. So the first one, focus. Well, <laughs> you've just experienced what focus is. So when we think we're focused, it's so difficult today because there's distractions in every element. We're distracted by our phones, by the internet, by emails, by people, by sounds, by our own thoughts. Distractions are constantly there. So mindfulness enables us to concentrate. And I think it's all about the concept of um, attention awareness, staying on track. Um, attention uh, focus and, and really focusing on where is my attention? Where is it exactly? Prioritise, where does my attention need to be? And then getting our attention there and staying there. That's what attention is, by resisting distractions, by noticing when we're distracted and noticing and bringing our attention back to where the focus needs to be, whether it's meditation or that difficult spreadsheet, doesn't matter. We can apply ourselves and be aware of where our thoughts actually are, not letting ourselves get distracted. Communication, well, there's a huge impact here for mindfulness. People know when you are present and listening to them and when they're not. You know it yourself when someone's giving you the aha, 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 and they're not really listening to you. So mindfulness enables us to be really present for each other, and there's no greater gift we can give one another than our presence. So it enables us to listen, listen properly, not distracted, not thinking about what we're going to say, but listen properly. It also enables us, that mindfulness, to think about how is the other person going to view our information or what we're saying? We can adapt our communication styles to be better in line with the people we're talking to so we can be more appropriate. We can also listen, pause, reflect and respond from a more wise and considered point of view and be more appropriate rather than perhaps shooting our mouth off without that because it can happen sometimes we start blurting things out without even knowing or realising what we've said. So mindfulness gives us that opportunity to pause and respond from a more productive, appropriate point of view. Leadership. Well, we talked a little bit about this at the beginning. Leadership and mindfulness go together because leadership is about being there for others, letting go of our self-oriented ways and checking if we are supporting our teams or are we hindering our teams? Are we calm? Are we clear? Are we considered? Are we proactively taking action or are we so lost with our own ways? Are we letting others shine or are we trying to take the glory? Are we inspiring the team? we bring out their best or are we focused on ourselves and our own credibility and our own reputations are we caring about their growth or focusing on our own we can choose care and compassion and let control of our own bias and assumptions and opinions to be more coaching more mentoring not command and control we can give each other give our teams time give our teams patience give them space and autonomy to be the best that they can so the, us as inspiring leaders through mindfulness can choose responsibility, compassion and generosity in the faces of challenge so others can be the best that they can through our own example. We have to lead by example and mindfulness enables us to be that example we want for our teams and our organisations. When we talked about leaders, they need to inspire the vision and so often we we don't really know what's happening. We don't, oh, sorry, I've skipped over there. I think I've skipped over decision-making. Decision-making, we have to make decisions all day, every day. And when we're in this default mode, so much decision-making is happening below the surface in our subconscious. It can affect what we're seeing or how we, we might habitually see things the same way and not really see them openly, clearly as they are in front of us. This can hugely impact our decision-making. When we're busy and we've got deadlines, there's more and more of this unconscious decision-making happening where we don't even kind of bring to consciousness the full facts. 
the brain is actually trying to save us, saying, well, you're so busy. I'm going to save you time by just going to default decision-making mode so you don't have to worry about looking at things closely. Whereas, in fact, we need to pause, stand back, clearly observe, observe things, objectively see the full story, see the, all the facts with clarity, not just what we think and caught up in default mode. So it provides better decisions, less overconfidence, less subconscious bias involved as well. Inspiring a vision, well, that's really clear. We can clearly define our vision. We can enable creativity in our teams by allowing them to try ideas, saying, I don't know how to achieve this vision. I'm going to hand it over to, for you to be more creative and be more open and spacious. We can um, allow ourselves new and different ways of thinking, which might come up to more creative um, ways of expressing our ideas and our solutions as well. We're more objective and we're more willing to learn from others who might come up with a better solution than what we thought. So we need to think about how we're enabling lateral thinking. Last of all, there's so many benefits, including resilience, the ability to cope with stress, relationships between ourselves, our stakeholders and our teams, not to mention health benefits, and most importantly, happiness. Who doesn't want to be happier? Do we all want to be miserable? I don't think so. The last point I want to make is when we talk about the benefits of mindfulness, don't take my word for it. Don't take the over 5,000 peer-reviewed research papers from psychologists and doctors about the benefits of mindfulness. There's so much out there and I'm not, you can just Google it and find thousands. Don't care. Try it for yourself. See if mindfulness has benefits to you. Costs you nothing, doesn't hurt mostly. <laughs> Try it for yourself and see if you can find the benefits for yourself. So a mindful agile leader is less frantic, can tain, maintain balance under pressure, can be more flexible in thought and in action. That's what agile is all about. Breaking that autopilot habitual way of thinking and truly be agile, support and facilitate our teams as an authentic leader become and present ourselves as the best version of ourselves in any given moment. We are accountable for our attitude so we can be an agile, have the agile mindset, be an agile leader and be self-aware, choosing wiser actions, wiser responses. And the last thing, which is a handout I want to give us, I'm just going to go through it because I want to leave some time for some questions, is the elements of mindful success. So we start with our objective. If we know our clear vision and objective, it drives what we pay attention to. Our mindfulness enables us to direct our attention and then enables us to choice how we think and how we act. Our actions and thoughts should lead us to the right success. There's a handout I'm going to be giving to all of you with this um, elements of mindful success. And of course, the slides from this presentation, I'll be making aware either through ConfEngine and I'll also make it available in the handout sections on this platform. So thank you for having me. I hope that you've uh, been inspired or learned a little bit. So go forward and be mindful, try it. Let me know how you went. Thank you very much. We've got some time now for some questions. Thank you, Kathy. It was a wonderful session and thank you for making us meditate. Um, I'm sure all of us have become really calm after you made us meditate, yeah? So a uh, thumbs up, all of you all, uh, for Kathy for uh, making us um, meditate during this session and keeping us calm. We do have questions, um, and I'm going to pick out the first question for you, um, Kathy. The first question is from Carol, and her question is, allowing chaos within a team to solve itself, never taking a stand in discussion, causing this chaos, would that be a right leadership technique? <laughs> okay, so servant leadership doesn't mean accepting chaos. It definitely means we've got to step in when there is chaos. If there's conflict, if there's confusion, if people don't know what to do, we can't let them just fall on their face and fail. We need to step in and take conscious, mindful action so we're not jumping in and telling people and reacting and being stressed and angry we can go in and say, hey, guys, how can I help you? I know that there's chaos. What can I do for you? And how can I resolve conflict if that's what's happening? How can I explain things if there's confusion, lack of understanding? So we have to jump in. We can't let teams just 
well, it's their team, you know, their servant leadership, so I'm going to let them fail. That's not a great way to go about it. But the mindfulness enables us to be aware of what's really happening in the team so we can look clearly at what is a more appropriate response. Completely agree. We have another question. question. Um, do you think a mindful agile leader should practice shared decision making? This is another. And the question is from Yeah. Right? Um, look, so we talk about empowerment. So some things we can empower the teams for and some things we can't. Can we give the team the budget? Probably not. Can we give the teams um, flexibility in standards? Perhaps not. So we need to understand what we can or what we can't share power, what we can empower them to make decisions on and what we can't. And we need to say how much consultative decision-making do they need our help with and how much can they do by themselves. So this is a team-based discussion where we understand with the team, not telling the team, but the team decides how much they can and can't decide for themselves because some things, of course, it's not up to them. So I think we need to be able to understand how much we share and how much we can't share. I agree. We have another question. Um, the question is from Sunil, and he's asking, how can we as coaches help leaders to discover their biases? <laughs> oh, so as a coach, I quite often say that one of my jobs is to hold a mirror up for people. Now, it's a great metaphor, but it's so difficult to do. You can't just go, hey, do you know that you're this, 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 this? That's not the way we do it. We need to think about, a, a, again, a mindful approach to coaching, which I firmly believe in. I think that mindfulness as a coach has made me a better coach because I quite often can project my own weaknesses or judge the, the other, whoever it's, whether it's a leader or a, or a developer or a tester, it doesn't matter. So mindfulness lets me let's go of that judgment and that. And I think, okay, what are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they feeling? And I question them, say, what did you see there? What did you do you think this? It's about asking more questions and helping them to their own conclusions and seeing it from a gentle point of view. But of course, sometimes it means mindful feedback as well. So when we think of mindful feedback, we've got to be making sure that we're not just poking fingers and poking in people's painful spots, we're doing it from that right intention. So mindfulness can help us think about how we can provide feedback as and when needed without it becoming subjective and pointed. Yes, um, and I agree. We've had situations of the same way as well. So um, I think those are the questions that we have. Let me just quickly look at the chat. Is there any questions posted there? Oh, yeah. Uh, so how can you decide when to intervene and when to stay away in a conflict situation as a leader? Jahan Paranja has asked that question. Um, so once again, that awareness, I think that when we are more aware of ourselves so mindfulness you can't make somebody else mindful so that's the first trick if we're more mindful ourselves we can become naturally more self-aware and when we're more self-aware we're more other aware so when there is conflict we're more likely to pick up when the conflict is constructive because we know that sometimes conflict is needed for people to challenge each other because we need people to challenge each other otherwise we have that group think mentality so some conflict is healthy but when we're aware, we can start seeing when it's crossed the line and become personal, become unproductive, become negative, and, of course, become, dare I say it, where people uh, are feeling threatened, uh, are being uh, disrespected. That's where we have to step in. We can't accept bad behaviour. So we need to sort of maintain an awareness of ensuring that people aren't being attacked for no good reason type of thing. Thank you so much, Cathy, for the wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank right. you, Fincy, for having me. And everybody have a wonderful, mindful day.